Welcome back to KC Talks EV. So for the last couple of years, my tumble dryer has basically been dying. I think it's either the bearings or the drum. And after a repair that basically reverted back to its damaged state, I thought it would be a very good opportunity to go buy a new one. Now, it turns out now there are two kind of big, heavy players in the market of tumble dryers, I guess. And well, first of all, one of them is the standard one, which I used to have. So a heating element condenser tumble dryer and this one. Now this is a heat pump tumble dryer. And I thought for this video at least, it would be a very good opportunity to talk about why this is definitely one of the ways forward. So anyway, let's get started. So the first section we're going to talk about is actually how one of these tumble dryers actually works. Now I'm sure that Richard from this old house in the US will critique my explanation on this, but since I am a teacher by trade, hopefully I don't butcher this too much. So there are three major components of a heat pump in general. So there is a evaporator coil, a compressor and a condenser coil. And we are going to talk a little bit more in detail about those stages. So whenever you, for example, boil a liquid, so in the case of a kettle, you're boiling water, what you're doing is you're giving it energy in order for it to boil. Now, because water boils at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, we need to give it more energy than the surrounding air temperature, or effectively that is a measure of energy. And as a result, that's why water doesn't boil at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, if we lower the pressure, just a kind of a fun fact, if we do lower the pressure, that does mean the boiling point does lower. So for example, if you try and boil water on Mount Everest, it is a slightly lower temperature in order to boil. I think it's either 67 or 72 degrees Celsius. I've completely forgot which one. So in the case of a heat pump, we actually use a particular fluid called a refrigerant. And these are special because their boiling points are significantly lower than ambient or about 20 degrees Celsius. So what then happens is in the evaporator coil, this refrigerant is allowed to evaporate. This takes energy away and puts it into the gas. Now we experienced that if I touched, for example, the evaporator coil in a heat pump, we experienced that as a cold coil. The reason why is because the energy from our hands is being transferred into the refrigerant. Now this is only very, well, it's only an elevated temperature in comparison and we need to compress it. Now this is done at the compressor. Effectively, it compresses it or puts it into a much smaller space, increasing that pressure. And in fact, actually, by a kind of byproduct of that, it concentrates the heat, which means it is much higher in terms of gas, in terms of temperature. Now, the reason why that's important is because that temperature has to be much higher than whatever air is flowing through the condenser coil in order for it to dissipate some level of heat. So by doing that, it dissipates some of the heat and because well, it's called the condenser coil, it condenses from a gas down to a liquid. Now this liquid is still a little bit warm. So what it then does is it goes through an expansion valve, which by the process of expansion, because compression increases temperature expansion or allowing it to expand, decreases the temperature and pressure massively, and then the cycle just continues. Now, the beauty, I guess, of a heat pump tumble dryer is that both the evaporator coil and the condenser coil are in line with each other. So in one case, you've got a cold side, which we'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a moment. And then we've got a hot side to heat the outgoing air into the drum, you've got a motor to spin the drum as per normal, and then the cycle just continuously repeats. The beauty, I guess, is that because there is still surrounding energy, assuming that the air isn't minus 278 degrees Celsius, which it probably isn't, effectively, we can actually scavenge this energy from the surrounding air and put it into a much smaller space, i.e. the drum, which basically means we can heat the clothes and then get some moisture out of the clothes. So this section, we are going to be talking about the benefits of having a heat pump tumble dryer versus a, what I like to call a standard condenser dryer or one that uses a heating element. So first of all, energy consumption. So the reason why a heat pump tumble dryer works so well is that essentially it has more than 100% efficiency. 
Now, you may be asking, especially given the fact that I just mentioned I'm a science teacher, no, you can't have more than 100% efficiency. We're not creating energy out of thin air. But if we take the example of a heating element tumble dryer, what we're doing is we are inputting in electrical energy and we're getting heat energy out of it. In the case of a heating element, that is probably one of the only appliances that you can have that effectively has close enough to 100% efficiency. And I hope it's not getting so hot that it's glowing red. But with a heat pump, if we measure the energy going in versus the amount of heat energy that's actually present in, for example, the drum, what we actually find is that it is beyond 100%. So, for example, I was reading a research paper on this regarding the amount of, of efficiency we're getting. We're looking at around 250% to 300% efficiency. Now, to avoid confusing people because of the reason that you can't get 100% efficiency, we use a value called COP, or coefficient of performance. And it turns out that most heat pump tumble dryers with the general temperature on the outside room, that does affect the efficiency quite a bit. That's the reason why heat pumps that heat up your house, for example, do tend to decrease significantly in COP when the ambient temperature outside your house drops. But it turns out in this case, we're looking at around two and a half to three or 250% to 300% in efficiency. And we actually see this when it comes to energy savings. So what I did was to run the test, I still have my old heating element tumble dryer. I actually got four towels and I washed them on the same setting. So I washed them on 20 degrees synthetic or something. And then I put them straight into the tumble dryer and measured how long it took to dry. Now, both of them have sensors. So I basically waited, I think in this case, I waited for the sensor, um, said it was dry. On my standard, I think heating element one, I think the sensor is going a little bit. So I ran it to the point where it was definitely dry. What we find is that the heat pump tumble dryer uses about 1.3 kilowatt hours of energy. It takes about two hours, 10 minutes to dry. Whereas my, you know, my standard, I think it's a Hoover um, condenser heating element tumble dryer, uses two and a half kilowatt hours of energy and took slightly less time in order to dry. I think it was about an hour and a half. Now, even though it does take a little bit longer, as I will go on to when we talk about power consumption, that still is a significant saving in energy. In that case, it's 1.2 kilowatt hours per cycle. And in my case, I probably use it two or three times a week. Um, the other people in my house probably use it a bit less than I do. But that means it's pretty much on at least once a day and saving 1.2 kilowatt hours a day is definitely noticeable, especially now with the current rises or price rises in energy. Now, this section is about power consumption. Now, my previous heating element tumble dryer used about 2.4 kilowatts of power when the heating element was on. Now, it doesn't constantly do this, for example, during the hour and a half cycle. It may do this for 10 minutes, then turn off for five minutes, and then so on. And what that means is, is especially for my solar array, bear in mind, I will actually make a video on that. I'm, I'm sure I will at some point. But essentially, what that means is, given the fact that my solar array can only really output 3.1, 3.3 kilowatt of power, and then factoring in the base load of my house, that can be about 500 watts and then go up to as much as a kilowatt if other devices are running. That basically means I'm pretty much on the cusp of not being able to run it and just about being able to run it when my solar array is putting out max output. And don't forget, I do have a battery that can output 2.6 kilowatts, and what we notice is that that drops it even further. Now, the beauty of a heat pump tumble dryer, on the other hand, is that this one is actually rated to be 800 watts. Now, I've measured it to be slightly higher. I think it was 830 watts that I measured. But the point still stands. Effectively, under any condition, so for example, if I'm outputting directly from my solar panels, or alternatively, if it's outputting from the battery, this tumble dryer can be run at all times regardless of the solar output. And that basically means that I'm utilizing much more of my solar drying my clothes as I possibly can. And that essentially is much better on the wallet because even during the day I could run one of these or alternatively it's using less energy at night and it's still saving me energy 
but I can actually now run this on the solar power, which effectively is, well, it's up that I have a lot of energy that basically gets exported and I can now run my tumble dryer on that energy that would be exported at basically nothing. Finally, I probably should mention that another benefit that we don't really see across, for example, a heat and element tumble dryer is that actually it's much better for your clothes. Now, I'm very lazy, hence why I have a tumble dryer like this and I use it that often, but effectively, it's not good to tumble dry your clothes. The reason why is because the high temperature normally causes them to shrink, regardless or not um, of the type of fiber it is using. Now, the reason why that's the case, it doesn't tend to shrink them as much, is because the drum is actually running at a much lower temperature, because again, as I mentioned, it's actually better to have a lower temperature difference between the outside temperature where you're scavenging the heat and the output temperature. And essentially what that means is, although I'm not telling you that you should do this, but it does mean that for fibers or clothes that are more sensitive to the high temperature, you can basically just run them straight through. If I'm perfectly honest, I'm not exactly the one to care in the first place, but most certainly I basically run everything through it, bedding, clothes, towels and things, and it seems to be absolutely fine. So one of the biggest drawbacks by far is the cost to buy one. Now my situation, it makes much more sense because obviously I was replacing a one, I was replacing one that was basically failing. So essentially the cost differential is going to be a bit less, but they definitely still cost more in comparison to a heating element condenser dryer. So for example, this is a eight kilogram model but if we compare the slightly bigger model, so a nine kilogram model, we're looking at around, it was about 230 pounds for a standard condenser. Weirdly, in terms of the Beppo models, they don't come with a window to see your clothes on cheaper models. So I did go, assuming that you didn't care about that, 230 pounds, if you want to see for opening, around 300 pounds, but the equivalent heat pump one would be around 470 pounds as of the time of recording this video. So that is about 60% more. Now, in the case of my one, this one, I did get it on a bit of a discount. So I paid £360 for this one. And then the condenser one was about the same price. So if, let's say, I was saving around 1.5 kilowatt hours, 2 kilowatt hours on every load, you know, if we're talking about once a day, you know, that could be around, well, about 30 to 60p a run. And that is still quite significant. If I used it around once a day, I'd be saving around £100 a year, or if we are sort of going towards the top end of that, we were looking at around £200 a year in savings. So essentially, this one at least, when I was looking at pricing, would probably pay itself back in about a year. And that's not to mention the fact that if I was running it during the day, it would actually be significantly more because there would be no way I'd be able to run that heating element tumble dryer without using any form of grid power. So effectively, the savings would be slightly more, but worst case scenario, I was looking at around £100 a year. And the cost differential basically means, yeah, the payback over the premium would be about a year, or essentially, you know, in about three or four years time, it would have basically paid for itself. So yeah, it is definitely a drawback to buy, and obviously, at this point in time, yes, you know, it is a significant increase in price, but most certainly, for me at least, it made complete sense. So in conclusion for this video, most certainly, this is definitely the future of drying clothes. And the thing is, is that we are going to see heat pumps in other areas as well. When it comes to actually buying one, if you're in the same position as me, so your one's dying, your older sort of heat element condenser dryers are dying, then most certainly, if you've got the extra money, then just go and buy one of these ones. I wouldn't really recommend upgrading if your current condenser or heating element one is absolutely fine. I think that cost differential means that you realistically wouldn't make your money back. And most certainly, it's not probably better for the environment to buy one of these. It's probably best to run your heating element one until it dies and then replace it, which would be probably the better sort of environmentally conscious option. So I think that's pretty much it. Now, what I probably should mention is this is going to become sort of another sort of series, which is sort of eco home stuff. So anything that I come across where I inevitably do replace them, 
or for example, um, anything to do with how to get the most out of your solo array, for example, this section or this series of videos is going to be that. So if you liked it or you found it informative, please give it a like, dislike it if you don't, make sure you are subscribed if you are not already, and make sure you share this video to anyone who is considering buying some new home appliances. If I'm perfectly honest, I did find it quite difficult to make this interesting, um, but I do like the sites behind it. So I think that's pretty much it. So thank you for watching and talk to you later.